the Fuji Cast. Welcome to the second Fuji Cast, a chance to talk about all things Fuji Film. Today on the show, you've got mail. We've got some good、um, questions actually lined up for you today. Hopefully, you'll learn some stuff as well. Some more comments, questions, even trolling from,、uh, from YouTube. I wasn't sure whether to do the trolling thing, to be honest, but I thought it was quite fun listening to some of the, <laughs> some of the trolling that goes on. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't intend for that, by the way, to be an invite for you to、uh, email in with stuff just to see if you'll appear <laughs> with some kind of trolling feature, but there we go. It's part of life. Some more gizmos for the, for the wish list, and、um, we are going to talk about Martin Parr today. He is. Um, our bookshelf guest, if you like.、Um, oh, and also part two of my walkabout in Sydney with Marcus Anderson, street photographer and Fujifilm ex photographer. That's coming up on the,、uh, the show. I thought we'd start, though, this week with,、um, with word on the street about the state of shooting weddings, a kind of state of the industry address. Now, I realise not everybody shoots weddings, so before you think, oh, and we'll just fast forward to the next bit. Um, it is something I, I think that's affecting photography in general. This,、um, this, 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 this thing now that there's, there's, no, there's no absolute barrier to, to entry. And I, I met、um, last night with a photographer that's, that's been in the industry much, much longer than me. And he said to me, You know, I just I don't understand. I mean, he's an incredibly talented, gifted photographer, completely different style to, to my own work and what I, I enjoy. So he's more set up. Um, beauty shots at weddings. He said, I just don't, I don't get the industry anymore.、Um, he said, admittedly, when I started, I was photographing brides and grooms that were my age. Then I was photographing brides and grooms、um, and I was their parents' age. And now I'm photographing brides and grooms and I'm their grandparents' age. And I, I, don't, I don't think I understand the industry anymore. Therefore, is, is it time to get out? I'm not sure that's relevant, though. I don't think, I mean, let's take Joe Busink. Um, he's still shooting weddings. I, re- I saw that he recently came back because he was ill for a while, I think, wasn't he? I think so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's in his 60s and he's shooting Hollywood A listers、mm-hmm. um, and, and incredibly、uh, lavish weddings, alongside, funnily enough, not so lavish weddings.、Mm. I saw he popped up at a venue that I've worked at、um, just outside London. So, I thought that's interesting.、Mm. And age means nothing to, to Joe and he's in his 60s.、Mm. I think, yeah, I mean, who knows? There's definitely, there's definitely turbulent times in the wedding photography industry, but I think generally, as you said, the photography industry, and maybe age is a. I don't know whether it's a, a thing or a really a factor as such, but I definitely think that, you know, there are, and, and this is obviously because I'm just getting older, but there are a lot of younger photographers out there who are,、um, you know, spending a lot longer at the weddings and staying till kind of midnight and, you know, getting drunk with the clients and, and all that kind、the、of stuff. The vomit shots. Vomit shots,、mm. um, which is fine, you know, absolutely fine. It's, it's good to be different, it's good to offer something, and, and there's no complaints from me in terms of what people do.、Um, but, you know, age do clients look at the age of the photographer?、Mm, I'm not so sure. Uh, I really don't know. I mean, you know, if you have on your website, look, you know, I'm a, I'm a 20 something year old, I'm going to come and have fun at your wedding, and I'm going to be there from 9 a.m. until midnight. And yeah, if that's on your website, it's part of your marketing, then that, the clients will make a decision based on that, and that's fine.、Um, but if on your website there's no kind of indication of your age or anything like that, and, you know, you might have a pot shot of,、uh, of yourself on there, then I don't think clients typically would, would worry about the age. I really don't. It's a safe pair of hands thing as well, though, isn't it? Yeah, you I think, th- so. I think if, if you've, if you've,、uh, if you've garnered some experience of life and obviously of the, the industry of shooting weddings,、yeah. then having some experience and being a safe pair of hands, there's, there's got to be some credibility and currency in that. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, y- y- you know, yeah, I, you're absolutely right by saying that. It's, it's definitely true. I, but generally, overall, I, clients, I, I, it's the pictures. Surely it's the pictures.、Mm. And, you know, and the price, of course. Um, See, now that, that's the next point, price. I, I think price pointing has come down by such a lot over the last couple of years.、Um, hmm. I, I, you know, there, was, there was a time when, okay, let's, let's take,、um, is this, it's so difficult to have average costs. But say a wedding used to cost from a photographer somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000. I would bet now it's somewhere between $1,000 and $1,500. Yeah, I agree. And there are a lot of factors that are coming into play here.、Um, I think 
it's very easy now to be a good wedding photographer you know i mean back in the day when we started we were the new and that wasn't that long ago no of course and, <laughs> and we were the new photographers and we were making mistakes and we were undercharging and we were doing all this and all that kind of stuff so i you know i'm very conscious of not sounding like a bitter old old man you know and it's not like that i'm very happy and i, I do workshops and i educate people to you know to come into the industry and and that's a good thing the more people that are that are doing it well that's a good thing for the industry um but i do think it's now a very it's very saturated but also the the barriers to entry are like zero the the cameras are like the xt3 and and you know i i remember saying to fujifilm about the xt3 and the price point so we're at between 1200 and 1300 depending upon where you look yeah and if you get that's that's in pounds and you're going to have cashback deals and all sorts of stuff like that you know you could you'll be looking at getting this high what i consider a high-end very capable dual card slot 4k video all that kind of stuff thousand eleven hundred pounds something like that and that is that's that's great of course because we're all spending less money on the equipment okay that's that's the good point but from a photographer's point from a professional photographer's point of view um you know there's there's no there's no way of um there's no barrier really from other people entering the industry and just literally grabbing one of those up and running you know put a website together really quickly and away you go now at the same time i you know i'm very cautious and very conscious of of saying that you know that's not necessarily a bad thing that's just the way it is so it's a fact that the barriers to entry are less software is much lightroom adobe uh, photoshop all of that kind of stuff you get um you know there's free raw editors there's there's online stuff and web squarespace you can have a website done in in a matter of minutes and and that's good i benefit from all of these things also i'm not i'm not knocking them i'm just saying that these are a fact mm. these are facts that are affecting the industry for sure and it's not just wedding photography industry of course you well know. portrait industry has been affected by that big time do you do i mean in the uk we had um uh, what was that big portrait company that that uh, were famous for venture. the white backgrounds? Venture, of course, Venture, of course. Um, now I think Venture still exists, does it? In some places, I think they've got like three or four still. But, but, around. but remember, people used to say, "Wow, Venture so great," but it was really pricey. Mm-hmm. I mean, you would not come out of a Venture studio um, if the sales pitch had been done correctly, spending any you know under under one thousand mm-hmm. pounds. And now you have portrait photographers on the high street that are happy to charge forty, fifty, sixty quid. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. affected their business as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's affected everything, you know. And and it's not even just photography. I remember when I was um, still doing web design stuff back in the day. You know, the in those days to buy um, Dreamweaver, which is what we used to use. To oh, I used that. Yeah. The very first website I made was Dreamweaver. Build website. Yeah. It used to cost a fortune. Yeah, and it, and it took a while to learn it. Absolutely. And then Adobe, uh, what was the original foundation of what they what we now know as Creative Cloud, but it was called Creative Suite back in those days. Mm. It used to come on about 55 DVDs. Um, and that became affordable. The software became affordable. Photoshop became affordable. Web designers used Photoshop. It was no longer a two and a half thousand pound package. It was something that was two and oh, it was two thousand pounds for all of their packages, and it became affordable. And then you had you know what we used to call bedroom web designers in those days. Um, so it's it happens. That's life. It's you know it's not, it's that's just the way things fall. And you know you you can't blame the companies. I mean Fujifilm in terms of pricing of the XT3. Of course, by bringing the price down, they're going to sell more. That's that's their mm. remit. That's that's what they want, um, and nobody wants them to suddenly go. Actually, we're gonna we're gonna charge four thousand pounds for a camera, uh, you know, not, not not kind of APS-C. And but you know, I want to spend less on my cameras, of course, because it saves me money. But at the same time, it is an absolute fact that the lower the price of the cameras, the more people enter the marketplace. That's just economics. As simple yeah. as that. Less people getting married these days, you know, supply and demand. It's 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 economics. It's that's it. And I also think people being much more uh, image literate now uh, means that perhaps there's less of a value placed on photography. Uh, and I, by that I mean, look, if you go take a um, go take a, a, a great photo on your your iPhone or your your Android or whatever you're using, and then you've um, you've got something like Lightroom um, as an app on that phone. Uh, you can change contrast and clarity and uh, color balance, geometry. You can you can go through pretty much the whole gamut of what you would do 
on the um, on the desktop app, but you can do that on your phone. Oh. Put a vignette on it, or maybe go to a, a shoot it out and put another app. You can put some some sort of um, some light. Um, effects on it as well and bang you've got an image you put it on on uh, on instagram and you think look at this look at how professional that looks yeah. does that mean you you think that people um then undervalue the the work of a professional photographer because they think well i can do it why do i need to spend 1500 to 2000 pounds when i can probably get one of my friends now mm. yeah i mean i it's hard to to kind of understand what goes through people's minds. It's it's interesting though that I have um, I've had two actually three of my ex wedding clients who are now um, have become wedding yeah. photographers. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that, and they've come to me for education. Yeah, and which is great, and 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 they you know because they liked what I did, and one of them actually said to me. It, it it just looked the results are great, but it just looked so easy that you know I wanted to give it a go, <laughs> and um, uh, you know and maybe it is easy I don't know and, and but it, it's he you know he's now finding out actually that the taking of the pictures is the easy bit it's the business and yeah. you know and now the calls I get from him are how do you get clients you know how do you mm. how do you book a wedding um, and that's that's the hard part of being a wedding photographer the, the actual taking the pictures probably is the easiest bit <laughs> well i have a, a second shooter that i use you know him is alex mm -hmm. and uh, i shot his wedding yeah. um and and now he's shooting weddings with me yeah it doesn't feel strange at all but no. um yeah um it, it happens doesn't it yeah, yeah, yeah and another photographer who's gone on to be a, a just a superb uh, wildlife photographer i shot his wedding as well and his wildlife shots are, are just amazing mm. yeah interesting one if you have any thoughts on this by the way email us uh, click at fujicast.co.uk um, love your emails because we can uh, we can put that into the the email segment of the show talking of which click at fujicast.co.uk if you have any questions um, here's um, some mail stuff for this week i'm going to start with one from steph m dynamic range auto or not big question mark because uh, it you can have 100 200 400 or auto correct so um I mean, it's not a case of the bigger the number, the better, is it, on this one? No, uh, no, absolutely not. And uh, is, there's usually a bit of confusion with this. So uh, in the Fujifilm world, there is a setting called dynamic range. And as Neil just said, you have auto 100%, 200% or 400%. Mm -hmm. And essentially what that's trying to do is save your um, detail in your shadows and your highlight areas. So think about those, um, those percentages as multiples of the exposure. So 100% of one is one hmm. right so in my mind although uh, you know this is not necessarily confirmed by anybody even though i've asked it many times 100 percent is the equivalent of off in that menu setting okay so i 100 percent of one is one off nothing changes 200 percent or 400 percent effectively it's going to um, multiply the exposure but usually by increasing the iso to keep the detail in the shadow area okay so when you're at 200 percent i you cannot shoot at anything lower than 400 ISO, I believe. And at 800%, it's 800 ISO. That's right. So the camera is dealing with it in, in that way. Now, there's a couple of things to remember here that this setting only affects JPEGs. Okay, the RAW files are, are unaffected by the um, dynamic range setting. However, <laughs> with a little caveat, some of the RAW software packages will read that setting and adjust the exposure accordingly. Lightroom doesn't. Lightroom does. Oh, it does? Yeah. So, oh. And it does it artificially. So you'll have seen many times when you've brought RAW files into Lightroom and then suddenly it goes really dark, the image goes really dark. Mm. Um, and that's because it's reading that auto, uh, it's reading the um, dynamic range setting and uh, affecting the exposure accordingly. But it's just artificial because you just drag the exposure slider back up. Mm. Um, but if you're shooting JPEG, then it's baked in. That's it. You're, you're stuck with it. Um, so auto is essentially letting the camera do it, making the decision. 100% is essentially off. 200% and 400% are your your own choices. These days with the X uh, with the X Trans three and X Trans four sensor sensors, I typically leave it at 100%. I you know I just leave it at 100%. And uh, you know when I'm shooting JPEG, I, you know what you're seeing in the viewfinder is what you're going to get so you've got your eyes to help you and yeah. you know it's it's pretty simple that way okay you've got a good one here this one it, 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 there almost isn't an answer to it 
Mm. Yep. So, so subjective. Yeah. So uh, this email is from somebody called Tim Hothersall. Uh, or Hathasal. And his question is, if you if you could only have one camera, what would it be um, and why? And so, the, obviously, you know, I have uh, a lot of Fujifilm cameras. I also have some non-Fujifilm old uh, legacy film cameras, Pentax and uh, Canon A1, I think, something like that kicking around. Um, but from a commercial and professional point of view, I just use the um, digital cameras. And I've got lots of... <laughs> have lots of them i have got the original x100 100s 100t 100f xt1 xt2 xt3 X have you ever sold any of them yeah i have actually right. um i recently sold um two xt2s because i had three of them um i sold an xt20 i sold an xe2 um no actually i never had an xe2 sorry i sold an xe1 uh yeah so lots of things and some of the cameras like my daughter has got my old x30 um so she she runs around with that um but yeah i do i do sell them and the the fact is because i i you know i often you know have these things that sit in the cupboard and the state of your cameras don't though, use it they're awful i would never buy a camera from you no <laughs> yeah my cameras are- yeah they they are just beaten up yeah, and they I, look. I mean, I love that sort of used look, but yours go, yours extend beyond used. Uh, yeah, it's because I don't like lens caps or hoods no, no, or anything like no, that, no. and so they do get knocked. And your camera bag, it just you throw them in. It's it's yeah. like a Mary Poppins bag. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I'm pretty. Um, yeah, I'm pretty relaxed about all that. But, yeah. Um, don't tell the insurance company. Um, <laughs> we'll edit that bit out. <laughs> so the answer. Take if, that bit out. If I, um, if I actually, absolutely, one hundred percent, had to only have one camera out of my entire collection, right of the Fujifilm ones, of the Fujifilm ones, I would go for the original X100. No way. Yeah. I just remember that as being possibly the worst camera I, it I was ever terrible. owned for dynamic range and terrible. focusing in backlit conditions. I, I remember I took it abroad. We we went, uh, where did we go? We went to Crete, I think it was, and um, we went on, on EasyJet, and they had, um, they had a competition where you had to guess the amount of miles between Gatwick Airport and whatever the airport was in Crete. And uh, on. Heraklion. Is it Heraklion? Yeah, Heraklion. Yeah. Crete is the first place I had red wine in my life years ago, <laughs> and and that started the rot. Anyway, I digress. It was the you know they they say you never ever taste red wine again the same way as your first ever glass. Have you ever heard that? No, but I never. can't remember my first glass never either. Again. Well, okay, <laughs> I, I do remember my first glass. I um, anyway, we we had this um, we had this competition. We guessed the the range, the, this flight range, and we won. Hmm. And the prize was when we got to the other end, you were allowed to go into the cockpit and sit with the um, with the captain, get a photograph taken, etc. And so uh, my eldest son Jack would have been I don't know four, four, five at the time. Um, how many years ago is the X one hundred? Two thousand and eleven. So seven years. Maybe it's even more then when we took that photo. Hmm. Not um, two thousand and twelve, two thousand eleven, two thousand and twelve. I think. Anyway, I went into the cockpit with this X100, the original X100, and um, the light was streaming in. It was, you know, it was powerful light. And this camera just could not focus. Mm. I wanted to throw it out the window. <laughs> um, however, I did take it everywhere with me. Mm. And, and actually, one of my favourite pictures on my website is an X100 picture taken at a venue called Silchester House. Yeah. It was one of those cameras that oh, I totally agree with you. I, I had one, it arrived one morning and I took it to a wedding that afternoon and um, by the end of the day I was ready to just throw it in the bin. Um, but the images that did turn out were uh, spectacular. Mm. They were beautiful. And I think the the reason why I picked that now is because it subsequently had a several firmware updates mm. and made it a lot more capable as a camera. Um, still nothing compared to what the X100T and S and all those that and came F, after yeah. it were. Um, but there's something about that camera. There's something about the files that the original X-Trans sensor produced. Um, what do you mean in terms of colour or contrast or...? Uh, I don't know. There's something about the feeling of those files that are different. People say that about the Canon 5D range. They mm. say that um, the original 5D, going to 2 to 3 to 4, mm. um, the colour, the feel of it, there's something about that original 5D which people 
absolutely adore. Yeah. There's never been replicated in subsequent variants of that design. No. And I can understand it because when sensors change, things change. You know, that's mm. the whole point of having a new sensor. So, yeah. um, but I, you know, I love that camera. I still have it and I still take it to You places. still got the original one? I still have it. Wow. And actually, I still, I mean, it looks like crap that, yeah, that must be, literally must have buttons falling off it, it is, knowing you it's pretty ropey but yeah. i still i also i don't keep my camera boxes I never keep camera boxes but that's the only in fact the only camera boxes i've still got are the x100 my x pro one which um was a skinned version fujifilm uk did a skinning service at one point skinned yeah so i had my x pro one i had a, a black leather ret type skin put on it. It looks really cool actually. Okay. But they did also do um I think Damien Lovegrove probably went for the tiger skin, leopard skin look <laughs> and uh Dave Kyle Piper probably went for the crocodile skin or something. Based on their underwear. Uh, yeah. But it was a it was a commercial you know, it was something the Food Film UK offered and yeah. um and you know so I had mine done and it came back in a different box. So right. you sent it off the, the X-Pro one you sent it off to Fujifilm and then they sent it back in a completely different box and it's had this uh, what do they call it um, signature editions they called it oh. and um, I think I think they still do it but I think it's only done via John Lewis now I mean don't quote me on that but it's still something they, that so you can still rid. skin a only the X-Pro one I think is what they did right um, so see I've still got my my X-Pro one is yeah in a glass cabinet behind me yeah i still okay i keep my x pro one also but i haven't got the x100 x100 yeah that would be the camera now of course if it was but there's a romantic attach sorry to interrupt you but there's a romantic attachment for you because had you not bought uh, bought or picked up that x100 you would not be involved with fujifilm to this day no quite right um and yeah i mean i've got a lot to be thankful for in that regard but of course if it was if the question was if you could only have one camera that you needed to use to shoot weddings mm then the answer would be different because the X100 is not capable. I'm, I'm going to guess what one you'd choose. Go on, I think, I think you would go for the X-Pro2. No. Oh. I would, no. If you'd asked me that six months ago, yes. But no, I would have to say the X-T3. Right. Because the X-T3 is... But you're a big fan of that optical viewfinder alongside the EVF. Yeah, I... Which, of course, you don't get with the X-T3. No, you don't get it with the X-T3. But what you do get with the X-T3 is a much better camera than the X-Pro2. Simple as that. You know, it's technically a better camera. Um, And, you know, eventually, hopefully, who knows whether it will even happen, we'll get an X-Pro3. And presumably that will be, if they follow the same time uh, guidance as before, it will have the similar kind of functionality as the X-T3, in which case that will then become my I, new favourite camera. I hope if they do, that they increase the size of that EVF because the, I loved the X-Pro2. I yeah. thought it was fantastic. It felt good. It looked good. And I know it's not about what it looked like, but but it just it it was the it, do you know what it's the only camera I've ever been asked questions about from 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 people when I'm shooting with it. Uh, What's that? Yeah, wow! Yeah. Um, but the EVF was tiny. Hmm. I found that really hurt my eyes. Yeah, see, I never had any issues with that, but you're not the first person to say that, you know. And I guess I don't know. It's it's hard. Like Fujifilm have to make these things different. It's not. It it can't just simply be the same camera with a very different skin on it uh, otherwise people wouldn't buy them yeah. they just basically buy the first one that was released so from a marketing point of view they have to make these cameras slightly different in some regards okay um, all right um questions i've got one tebby tan on my xt3 since you mentioned xt3 when using auto iso set at min 160 max 1600 uh, minimum 1 one hundredth shutter speed. The camera doesn't want to go below ISO 320. On, an, on a sunny day, for example, it's using exposure under 1 four thousandth. Any idea how to fix this? Do you even understand that one? <laughs> kind of. It made sense when I when I looked at it earlier. Yeah, so he's using auto ISO. And to tell me what the maximum ISO was set at? Max 1600, min 160, 1 one hundredth shutter speed. Camera doesn't want to go below ISO 320. So on a sunny day, of course, that's going to cause you problems. Which camera? XT3. This is an XT3. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's just a case of exposure. Um, 320. Uh, it depends a little bit on things like the dynamic range setting that mm. we talked about. It depends a little bit on things like the uh, the aperture that's being used, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, I mean, the, the only thing really that to be aware of with the auto ISO stuff is that the minimum shutter speed is a recommended minimum shutter speed. Yeah. So the camera may well go lower than that. Um, but yeah, I mean, ISO 320, yeah, I mean, I'm just assuming it's because of the exposure it's coming in at. But uh, I Do you know. use that variable ND filters or anything? No. No. Um, I use them for filming, but I don't use them for, Not for, for shooting. shooting. No. No. No, no. I like the ones where you can actually pop them on the front with a, with a magnet. Yeah. They're the, they're the ones I like. I think we should... There's a good trolling, this one. Uh, let's have a trolling. Fuji is good for a hobby, a really good one. I would say on a par with, wait for it, Leica. <laughs> but as a workhorse, the good old full-frame Canon Nikon are the only cameras to use. Uh, that's not so much of a trolling. But I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I found the camera as a workhorse. I mean, the X-T3 is my workhorse. I And, and um, it's... It's a pretty resilient bit of kit. I, I've dropped it twice now. Hmm. I've got one of the... Have you got the holsters that you... Um, yeah. The little spider holsters, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. I got reasonably good at actually dropping into the holster mm-hmm. without ever having to feel for the holster, anything like that at all, just in there, didn't even have to think about it until the day um, uh, that I'd forgotten to put the little holster thing on. And um, I went to put it in the holster, first, first couple of shots of the day, and just dropped it straight to the floor. Yeah. Bang! Concrete floor. Um, I thought, oh no, there we go. <laughs> Everything fine. Lens fine. Camera fine. No props at all. Hmm. I mean, they're resilient, aren't pride? they? Pride? How was your pride? No, that, I mean, that was rubbish because everybody looked round at me. There's <laughs> <laughs> not much you can do about that. Yeah. But if, I mean, on that point, that question about the Canon and, and Nikon, and it's, t- it's just totally subjective, yes, isn't it? it is. You know, and it's... It, there's a lot of people on the internet who uh, they they only accept that be, what they're using is the right thing, mm. and that's not true. You mm. know, it, it, just because I always use Fujifilm doesn't mean everybody else should always use Fujifilm. You know, it's just because I drive a Kia Sportage doesn't mean that you should drive a Kia Sportage, even well, I though do, I know I do. you do <laughs> drive a Kia Sportage. <laughs> Hashtag be like Kev. <laughs> but you know, the, the, those kind of comments they they're yeah. just they're just crazy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if you if you would like to email in, then you can do click at fujicast.co.uk. Send us in your emails and uh, questions are brilliant. Um, any thoughts or pointers to the show, brilliant as well, and uh, we'll feature them on next week's or, or or in the weeks coming on the show. Last week, we played part one of uh, my photo walk, if you like, around Sydney with uh, Australia's ex-photographer, uh, or Fujifilm ex-photographer, Marcus Anderson. If you haven't checked out his work, I thoroughly recommend that you do. Um, he lives, or, or certainly at the time, lived in the city, although our, our chat did um, progress to the fact that it's not a city that he necessarily enjoys as much these days. As a first time, have you have you ever been to Sydney or Australia? Never been to Australia. I mean, I tell you what, walking around that city and the light and the, I mean, I, you like light and shadows, don't yeah. you? And you uh, that that's that's your version of street photography, mm-hmm. heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know necessarily whether the light really is different in different cities. I mean, they say it is, don't they? Yeah. Uh, uh, I you, think it is. Do you think it's different? Uh, uh, yeah, certainly like a place like New York and Tokyo, the light is Is it harsher different. in New York? Or? No, it seems to be like in New York, I don't know whether it's because the light bounces around the buildings more and or there's just more light or the, the, the direction of the light travel because of the the way the streets are organised, you know, the the, the, quadrangle, uh, the quadrants and all that. Maybe, I don't know, but actually the, the temperature of the light and the warmth and the... You can feel it's different. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful. I love New York for that reason. Anyway, back well, to Sydney. Certainly, <laughs> photographing in Sydney, um, that's that's how I felt. I, I did feel that the light was, was, was different. Or maybe it's just a romantic thing of me being in Sydney. Anyway, the uh, the photo walk with uh, Marcus Anderson is part two. And, and by the way, this is quite a long interview in, in its entirety. So I shall be putting this on another podcast that I have called Breathe Pictures. You will be able to hear the whole thing very, very soon. Marcus Anderson. I want to come back to that thing you talked about in the cafe when you said that in, in Sydney, of course, you said, of course, not me, yeah. there's less characters. It's harder to yeah. photograph. Although I keep seeing characters. I know, <laughs> it's, um, it, it's, it, as a, <laughs> I, I guess the characters was the wrong word probably, because there are characters here. It's more... Are people more aware of you photographing them, do you think? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so in any, any different to, no. I think it's Sydney's probably a bit freer than a lot of places. I think people, especially in the city, I mean, there are a lot of tourists in here and I could just be a tourist. 
you know, and I think one of the things is shooting this street stuff is to move where, where there are a lot of people because where there are more people all congregated together, they're less likely to be aware of you. Whereas if it's just one person on the street and you're photographing them, they're going to be quite aware. But um, I think not so much characters are, uh, I don't know, the more things happening like a protest or there's someone in the street screaming something out. But I just found in other cities that there's more kind of things happening or there's a march happening. And I always find photographing those type of elements interesting because it adds to an image. But yeah, there are characters. I don't know, there are the more characters today, I must admit, than there are usually. <laughs> They've all come out for me. They've all come out for you. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, is that a cloud? Cloudless. Cloudless. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. See that? It's too far that away. Work, man, in the end? Not really. I was hoping she looked up. It was a bit far away. Four or five people walked into shot the moment you. Yeah. You aimed. I mean, it's got all people in the shot there, but that's that's just like one of those photos where you've got five position and you know six people in the right place at the right time. Do you find yourself looking at people making photographs? You just then you need to be a bit closer. So. Yeah, I think, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard for me, this is weird for me because I haven't shot with a 28 in a while. Yeah. Because the project I'm doing, it's a lot closer, so I'm... So tell me about this project and why, well, why it's the 28? Well, it's more breaking down, I'm trying to just break down street to little elements. Yeah. And shoot it with different types of tighter lenses and things like that to try and create something very different. So does this project have a name? No. It's not. I don't know, it's almost like uh, no name at the moment, just lots of rant, like ideas put together about what I need to get. It's so encouraging to hear somebody say that they shoot with the idea of printing. Yeah, well, that it has to be. It has to be the idea of a, a book, a zine, shows, because for me, there's no, like, there has to be a progression. Yeah. The next show has to, you know, get, you know, do something for you or uh, get your, get your, you know, just your personal body of work in a better position, or you, you need to show your work. If you shoot well, you're, you're proud of what you shoot, um, and you put thought behind it, then just going up on a, a an internet site or something is, it's a waste. Because your Instagram is very much your back catalogue almost, it? is, isn't it? it is, it's just, well, that's what I see the, through yeah, your Instagram. The, there's, Kind of the street stuff, but and there's a few of the images of books and things in there that I put up now and then. But the Instagram is is very much a random thing for me. Yeah. That is very much sometimes I just walking down the street and I take a photo with a phone, and it'll put up. Because sometimes you you just see something. And you think I oh got you never switch off as a photographer, so you uh, you shoot it and sometimes it's a good image and you think well I'll put it up. Yeah. And with, with social media, it is important to keep engagement going. You're still shooting the Lomo project, aren't you? Or um, not, does that not, stop now? That's, that stopped, um, but I am still using the equipment for one of the projects I'm doing, um, which is so different. To, it's no street, it's conceptual, and, it's, yeah. and it's, it's very abstract, and I need to do that type of stuff. So, do you uh, print your own? Um, I print my own black and whites yeah. in the dark room, but only... I mean, I, I can do a good work print, but I'm not a I'm not a master printer. I can only do a good work print in a dark room. Um, I've never been, even going back to school, I was never as brilliant with the dodging and burning my hand. I don't know. I just. But but the fact that you did print yeah. means you know what you're looking for now when oh, you're yeah. producing digital yeah, exa- work. Well, that's I think I mentioned that before was the fact that I've seen a. Let me see where. Go down this way. Let's try and find. The fact that I've seen, you see a darkroom print, it's easy to understand a black and white print, to know how tone should look when it's coming from film, when it's an organic thing. And I think um, even when you go to something like, you know, because sometimes digital, I just can't, I cannot handle smooth images like that look like a piece of marble. I know it's very subjective, but where do you think people go wrong when they're producing monochrome black uh, you know I think it's they're, they're too they're too perfect I think people it it looks like a robot you know they 
they worry about micro contrast and they yeah. get into there and they do things that are so hyper real that could not possibly be done in a dark room. I mean, I've seen some amazing things done in a dark room, but you know, I mean, some, I mean, I can't say I see a lot of it, but, but sometimes when I see digital black and whites, they're so, there's no imperfections, you know, and I think that's what I like about film, the imperfections of everything and weird stuff that happens, and I don't know. I like, that's quite interesting, you talk about imperfection as, as being something to be it's proud of within your yeah, I do. pictures. I think, I think... Um, don't be looking for perfection. No, because I, I mean, I don't think you'd ever find, I mean, you might, I'm not sure, but I think most photographers, uh, even with images that, from historical images that people consider extraordinary images, I'm yeah. quite sure they would say, yeah, but it was the photo I almost got before it that was the really good one. Because they saw something probably even stronger. And it, they either just missed it, or it didn't happen, or but it's still an incredible image. But I, I think all creative people, I don't know, you'd have to be pretty extraordinary to think you'll, oh yeah, that's a perfect image. I can't fault it. You talk a lot about getting nature in your pictures. What you're getting? Most of the time, you say you, you seem to want to make that picture if there's something yeah, I natural do. behind I like, it. I like the natural world, and I do like. Uh, I think um, there has to be more than just shadows and there has to be, you know, that woman holding a baby or whatever, or there has to be like a, if the leaves are falling down or, I like the elements too. That's one thing that always attracts me. I love elements. I mean, I remember looking at Joseph Kadelka yes. when I was studying yes. and I loved his work. And that's one of the things I guess- And when, he is very stark, isn't he? He is, and I, and I do like darker stuff. Yeah. I've always liked dark, I, I don't really like, that's why sometimes with street photography that's more humorous, it never- Some of his work's quite sinister. Yeah, I, I, the, the more humorous street photography has never personally appealed to me because I like more darker type yeah. stuff. And I've always liked Kadelka because I always like street photography, but street photography where they're traveling yep. almost. Like it's not just going, I mean, I guess what I did is just going to the street. How did you get involved with Fujifilm? What, what was the process then? The initial involvement came from, I think I did a project called Mirrored, which was uh, myself and a Turkish photographer called Elif, her name's Fisheye Dreams on Instagram. Okay. And basically what we did is, it was a Mirrored project, so I'd shoot images of Sydney. Yep. And Elif would shoot images of Istanbul. Great idea. And we mirrored images to, in many ways to not be able to tell which city was what. And we placed them time, together. Yeah. And um, we opened a show here in at the Australian Centre for Photography. Fuji knew of me. And uh, I had Fuji cameras. And what I think I suggested was that um, I will shoot Fuji entirely for my next project, yep. which was Cabramatta. Yeah, eventually we through, so we're just continuing our projects together. I just ended up a Fuji X photographer and now I'll do talks for them and go down to Melbourne and talk about the cameras and... There's a lot of noise about the brand, right isn't there? There's a lot of noise about the brand, which is great. Yeah, there is. And I think, look, I think, um, I think for street documentary work, they're really strong. And I really, I mean, I've got to say, probably the X-Pro2 is my favorite Fuji camera. It is. Yeah, it's become, uh, they're just a bit bigger. Yeah. Slightly bigger than this one. And uh, it, it's just. There's like a range finder style into it, which probably yeah, aesthetically. I like it a lot and. Uh, helps as well. But I can change lenses as well. Yep. Not that that's a problem, I mean, this is fine. Yeah, I think it was just sort of a, a gradual progression. Can you put your camera down ever? Yeah, yeah. Well, this I can. I aggravate everyone with my phone because yeah. you always see things and I'll be talking to someone and I've disappeared and I'm running down the street trying to take a photo of something or, you know, as a photographer, you can see something from over there and go, oh, that looks interesting. I'll have to go and have a quick look to see if it's what I think it is or it has some potential. I don't know what, there's no reason for it. It's just a, you've got to always keep shooting. Keep your wife your sees that look in your eye. Yeah. You're, you're out, she knows she's lost you. It's like, oh God. To, to a picture. Oh, see, see, if that had only said love or hate or something, I could use that. 
So the tape on the floor said Luke. <laughs> yeah. Not love. That's a Star Wars reference there. <laughs> Marcus Anderson with our Walk About Sydney as uh, our guest and second part of uh, that series. If you want to hear the first part, of course, go back to uh, last week's, which was the, the very launch of uh, the Fuji cast. Next week's guest will be Patrick LaRock. And actually, the audio for Patrick's piece is taken from... Um, it was taken from Bath from the it was a Fujifilm weddings X wedding X weddings conference yeah and there were about 30 or 40 people weren't there um or maybe more 50 50 55 50. I think it was with a number uh yeah that seems like ages ago now it, it does was, it was June last year yeah and Patrick LaRock came across from Canada he is an amazing photographer mm-hmm. and uh even a more amazing storyteller on stage mm-hmm. um because he he just, I mean, he graphically told this story about his journey um, through photography. And at times, of course, he was going to give up, wasn't he? Mm. He'd had it. Yeah. He wasn't going to do any more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he took this, it is road trip. That's right. A self-discovery road trip across Canada. God, um, don't we wish we could all do a self-discovery road trip? Gemma went, because my wife was there at the time, and we're listening to him tell this story, and she was with, don't you get any ideas, <laughs> she was saying. <laughs> Where would you go on a self-discovery road trip? Um, I'd go to Scotland. I love Scotland. Right. Yeah, even though I'm Welsh. But Scotland is the most beautiful part of the United Kingdom in my mind. Yeah. I love it. You can just disappear That there. would be a really good place to go. Yeah. I'd like to do mine across uh, Italy. Hmm. I love... I did, a, I, I, did, I did do a road trip across Italy many, many years ago. I drove through... Um, France, Luxembourg, uh, Belgium, Italy, not necessarily in this, this order, Germany, and uh, stayed in this gorgeous um, village, which was a walled village, proper walled village. You can imagine the Sicilian mafia mm. sort of guarding the entries and exits. And uh, it was, I wish I'd have done it now with um, a recorder, an audio recorder and uh, a camera, because yeah. I didn't. Yeah, yeah, took yeah. hardly any photographs. Yeah. What a shame. Anyway, so uh, Patrick LaRock next week. Right, um, we've got a wish list. Um, the wish list, by the way, is um, it's not so much our wish because it's stuff that we already have, but it's, um, it, it's kit that um, we both consider, um, you know, would, would, never be, would never be out of our, our kit bags. In fact, we should do one week. We have to do a kit bag one because mm-hmm. you, um, like me, are a collector of bags. Mm-hmm. Yeah, too many bags. I hide my bags away. I've never sold any. <laughs> they, uh, they're they either in the attic or they are in the shed. <laughs> I will never get rid of a single bag. So, But this week, actually, it's camera straps. Um, I'll go first, uh, if you don't mind, with Peak Design. Um, I must admit, I didn't know about Peak Design until I saw, and there's a great YouTube channel, both of us follow him, Peter McKinnon. Mm-hmm. And um, I was looking for a strap that you could... Um, that that would have little toggles that you could attach to the camera which would always be on but you could take the strap on and off really really easily and that's what peak design straps do and um it it adds another anchor point of your filming because i film a lot with the fujifilm kit that i have um so you could stretch stretch the camera out in front of you and use the anchor point around your neck if that makes sense and you've got you know another anchor another anchor point uh, another anchor point so um that's mine peak design straps i think they're about 50 60 pounds we'll have notes to these by the way in the show notes so links to these in the in the show notes but yours is not peak design no although i do have peak design um straps also um and and i do use them occasionally very good um but generally the one i use for uh at weddings at least is a uh, what's called an up strap u-p-s-t-r american american strap isn't it excuse me yeah it's an american company and I think I'm not sure but I think it's just a, one guy who runs his own little business and I actually got these are still the same straps I used from um, when I shot Canon mm. so they are they're, they're made of Kevlar so they're non-slip um, they're very really traditional black horrible kind of looking things um, I mean they're bulletproof as well they're bulletproof <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, Kevlar bulletproof but they, they're great because they, they literally are non-slip and they're, yeah. they're very discreet they're just black and it's just nothing you know they're not flashy they're not 
not there's no cut there's no kind of red flashes on them or anything like that um and i'm i don't like to have cameras across my body i like to have well i have one on the hip which um using the little um spider holster yep. and the other one on my upstrap across my on my shoulder i don't i don't like to have them um on oh, you don't put it around your neck cross no not no. really i don't like to have them on cross harnesses or around yeah. my neck as such and see things that, like that that's so. the peak design is on a cross yeah cross harness no, system i don't like for that me. Yeah, I I really don't like that. I mean, I've got Peak Design straps that are just regular camera straps that, yeah. that have the toggles that you can remove. Um, and I'll use those if I'm just going out to shoot some street or something. I might clip that on. Um, but no, at weddings, I like to... I don't know about you, but I have... I typically shoot with two lenses, two bodies, two lenses, a 23 and a 56. Mm. Um, and because I'm a very simplistic person, I like to have my the lowest number... <laughs> camera on the left hand side and the biggest number camera on the right hand side so and okay. of course i know for sure but like the so the 23 is typically the one with the, the camera with the 23 mil is typically the one on my up strap yeah and the 56 is typically the one yeah, no, in my, I work the same way in yeah. my holster because 56 is on the right and 56 is bigger than 23 although my holster's on the <laughs> i keep the holster on the left i just always know that on my hip it is the lens that has the uh uh, the longer focal length. Do you keep your holster on your left hand side? Yeah. Are you left handed? No. Ah, oh, that's weird. Why would you do that? Do, what, have you ever tried it on the right hand side? Um, I should do. Yeah, because if you're right handed, it's much easier. I pull it out with my left really quickly and have it, and yeah. Mm. Isn't that a cack, cack handed way of working, isn't yeah, it? I think so. Well, it seems to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from when I drop the camera, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's nothing to do. That's just to do with the fact you haven't put the holster on. I saw, I saw somebody. I saw a picture once, and I don't know whether it was just a made-up picture using a spider holster. And they had it at the front, in front of there. What? Yeah, they had it on the top. So it looks like an appendage. It did look like an appendage, but actually, it was a real-life picture of somebody shooting uh, at like a street. Well, I guess it would scene. work, wouldn't it? Well, it would work for sure, but uh, I just think he just didn't quite understand that actually yeah. it wouldn't. That's very strange. Great. Yeah. Um, okay. So the, 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 that's the wish list. If you want to um, follow links to it, you can through the show notes by going to fujicast.co.uk. Book book for this week. We mentioned last week it was going to be Martin Parr, and it is Martin Parr. And there, there's a sort of a Marmite relationship with Martin Parr for many photographers, isn't there? I mean, it really is a love or hate, and it, and it goes back to that thing. You know, when you when you walk around um, art galleries and you look at some stuff and you say, God, my five-year-old could have painted that. Mm. And Martin Parr sort of attracts a similar um, ilk of comment uh, from photographers who don't understand this idea that um, anybody could walk up with a flash and bang, take, take the photographs or make the compositions that Martin does. But I, I that's not even half the story, is it? Not really. I think, yeah, you're right, Martin Parr is very Marmite. But actually, if you look... Um, into his history, his, his historical background of photography, his earlier stuff is very different to his current stuff. In what way? Um, well, if you look at his Hebden Bridge work, it's black and white and very much more sombre storytelling type photography. Um, beautiful, beautiful work. I still I love that also. But he's got so many books, and I think I must have all of them, um, that... Uh, you know, I, I like sometimes I look through my photo books with the kids, and this interestingly, the one I have here, Martin Parr, The Last Resort, is the one that Rosa really likes the most. Now, Rosa, to give you some context, is 11, and uh, you know, we flip through these books, and she loves it because it's it's basically beach scene, it's it's people on holiday, and it's your very typical. I'm not sure, I don't, I haven't really read the notes, I don't know if they're all taken in the same place, um, but they, you know, they're your they're kind of like you know, now I'm of a certain age where I remember when the seaside was like this um you know people would turn up in bus loads if the weather was good you know you'd, you'd all come you'd all you'd all have your sandwiches in a bag and you know the kids would be paddling in in little any pool of water they could find uh you know parents all smoking cigarettes and drinking cans of cheap lager that they got from it's the, my upbringing the wasn't at all like this wasn't it no oh, you had a no we didn't life. have any of this yeah, in, yeah, the, yeah. In, in the bahamas <laughs> <laughs> no I'm, I'm kidding yeah but I, I know exactly what you mean because yes when we went to we went camping a lot on holiday yeah and and so therefore it was they were typically welsh and english scenes usually of of people in in hats and socks with sandals yeah and and i think that's why rosa likes it so much because it, you know diff- things are different now you know you, do, you beaches are are cleaner and yeah. people are more 
you know, uh, there's, there's less people at the beaches. Maybe that's because we don't have so much nice weather. I don't know. But, um, you know, it's all, it's all very different. And uh, I just love looking at the pictures and looking at the, you know, and he's got this amazing talent now with this, this more modern work um, compared to like his Hebden Bridge stuff where... You know, he does stick a camera on, he does stick a flash on a camera and he does get in the face and he does, you know, you can see that it's flash lit and everything. And to me, I love the fact that he can do that and still, still manage to get these amazingly candid pictures. Um, now, you know, he's obviously working very quickly and, and the moment the flash goes off, I'm sure that's the point where people were like, hey, did you just take a picture of me? Um, but that's cool. You know, that's the way he does it. It's very, um, you know, it's, it's kind of Bruce Gildon-esque effect, I suppose. But I think that, you know, you look at these pictures, I look at these pictures and it makes me smile. And when I look at photography and it makes me smile, then that's a winner. Right? How do you deal with that? Because you do a lot of street photography. I, d- I don't do much at all. Uh-huh. And um, if you make a picture and then somebody says to you, well, what was that about? Well, that has never, ever happened to me. No. Never. Absolutely never happened to me. And nobody has ever said to me, did you just take a picture of me? Right. And it's interesting because whenever I do my workshops, I always talk to people about this. And this question comes up a lot. And I say to them, if it does happen to you, <laughs> then run. Yeah. Well, no, but just, you know, smile or just say, yeah, you know what I, is really interesting. You know, do you want to have a look or, you know, just explain why you took a picture. And, uh, you know, the, the politeness and humanity is the, is the biggest you know the thing that we all have in common and just explain something and then it's fine i mean i i have a you know as a street photographer you have your own ethical boundaries and so i would never take a picture of anything or anybody doing something that i would not be comfortable or yeah. uh, having that picture taken of me also um and i think that when you start stepping outside of those boundaries or changing the way that you shoot such as getting in people's faces and hitting them with a flash then that your boundaries are you know the the the, the clarity of that boundary is changing a little but there's bit. a brash nature to doing that like like bruce gilden or doogie um who's the guy in london that takes a lot doogie of pictures wallace. doogie wallace who takes um makes pictures outside uh, harrods harrods yeah of of rich people driving ferrari soft tops yeah and he's he's got some great books shoreditch and he's got um the uh, the hens and stags in blackpool as well yes amazing oh those images are incredible but you have to be a certain character to get those types of you shots do. you, you have get, to be you, brash and you don't care absolutely um and so you know it's that's just the way he does it and that's the way martin parr works to a certain extent as well although he is a very kind of i don't know but martin's images are a lot more gentle in in that nature but you don't see people in bruce gilden's work you see people looking shocked visibly shocked yeah he's in their face bang he gets this picture and um i've seen that incredible youtube film of him just facing people down in the street it's yeah. not your street, it's my street too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree. I wouldn't put Martin Parr and Bruce Gildon in the no. same same kind of style at all. Um, I think Bruce, uh, Martin's work especially is much more considered. Um, a kind of general overall feeling of Martin's work is that he's actually trying to curate memories of Britain Social you know, statement. British social, social statements, statement, yeah. times gone by, yeah. and you know all of that stuff. And and actually, I'm I uh, the last book I got of his was um, I can't remember exactly what it's called. I think it's called Food, <laughs> and it's about food. It's basically close ups of food. Right. And uh, he he lives in Bristol, and he he did a he launched his book at the the bakery, his local bakery, which is okay. you know in Bristol's obviously yeah. not far from me. And I went to the baker's and we sat there and we had uh, gin and tonic and talked to him about his book and he signed it for me. I had my picture taken with him. Uh, it was a very surreal moment. And I'm trying to look for the book now online here. What, what's it called? Uh, I think it's called Food. It was the it was the last one. Assorted Cocktail. Um, oh, hang on, I've got to go a long way. Down. How many books has he released? It was one of the last Oof. ones, so it would be... Is that in order? No. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Tbilisi, yeah, we've got yeah, 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 yeah. Danoon, toilet, toilet Paper. No, okay. it wasn't that one. Martin yeah, yeah, yeah. Parr Colouring Book. It, no, no, keep going. <laughs> Real Food, there you go. Real Food, where's that? There you go, right in front of Ah, you. there we Real go. Food. On it. the Gingham Tablecloth cover. <clears throat> That's the one. Okay. A Fiden. Um And, uh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah, it's... Pictures of people eating burgers. Yeah. Now, of course, you wouldn't... People, like you said, it's totally Marmite. Well, it's not Marmite, it's burgers, but you get the, you get the drift. And it's, you know... What do you make of it? What? It is social statement because you see things like spam, mm-hmm. pot noodles, pot noodles, 
Yeah, although they they look like, like they were taken abroad, not here. Yeah, the, the, actually, it is a it's a it's a global thing rather than just the UK. But yeah, yeah. it's you know it's it's it was just kind of summed up my opinion of Martin Parr was sitting in this bakery. Uh, you know, a very down to earth man. Yeah, absolutely, mm. uh, and I love his I love his work, and but totally his marmite. Absolutely. So, so the book this week is called The Last Resort by Martin Parr. The Fuji Cast. <laughs> Calling time on today's show. Thank you for listening and being with us. If you'd like to uh, contact us, we'll have an email address for you in a moment's time. Kevin, by the way, is uh, moving a book around that uh, we, we were dealing with last week. Um, on the bookshelf we had, what, who was it again? It was um, Bob Mazer. Bob Mazer, yeah. And, and, and he's found out that the book is worth £400. It, he's got a first, you've got a first edition, haven't you? First edition, yeah. £400. Yeah. Your coffee cup was on that only 10 minutes ago. It was, it's not now. Right. <laughs> so if you'd like to uh, look at our work uh, online and, and join us on our journeys with what we do on YouTube, then there's a way to do that. Um, Kev, go first. Simply search for Kevin Mullins on YouTube and you will find my channel. And mine is Neil James, N-E-A-L-E, Neil James. You'll find that. Website address is neiljames.com. Uh, commercial one at breathepictures.com, Kevin. Uh, my website address for all things feature film and personal photography is f16.click. And my wedding website is kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk. And Instagram, it is Kevin Mullins Photography. Oh, I, I forgot to mention my Instagram. Oh, I'll do that next week. If you'd like to email in, you can do so very, very easily by writing to click at fujicast.co.uk. Any questions, any thoughts, any statements, um, any trolling. I know you said don't do that. <laughs> but uh, just contact us through that and uh, we can respond to that on the show. Um, next week, by the way, uh, Patrick LaRock is the uh, the guest uh, when it comes to the... Um, when it comes to the guest segment of the show and I think you'll enjoy that because it, 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 it's his road trip and we talked about that a little bit uh, earlier on and I think it's uh, definitely worth a listen for, for Patrick alone we'll see you next week <laughs>